How could God possibly love me when my own father didn't love me? But he came up and he stood right in front of me and he stared at me right in the eye. And at that very point, God did something in my heart. At that very moment, Jesus became real for me. My name's Therese and I'm with the Missionaries of God's Love Sisters. I have been with the sisters now for 20 odd years and even to this day, I can't believe that God had called me into this life. I never dreamt and never thought when I get older or when I grow up as a little girl, I never thought that I would ever become a sister. I grew up in far north Queensland. We're a blended family. I got three brothers, one stepbrother, one stepsister, and heaps of really cute nieces and nephews. Growing up in my family, I did live a life of fear. My father was an alcoholic and he would, often when he would drink, he would get, things would turn a bit scary and he'd get a bit violent. And I probably carried this fear into my adulthood, into my young adult life. And I can remember when I ever would hear them talk about God's love or ever hear um, people or the priest, if I was to attend math, talk about God's love. I used to think in my heart, how could God possibly love me when my own father didn't love me? But I would think that God was somewhere off in the distant and didn't really care much about me and didn't, you know, up somewhere up in the clouds. I probably, as a young person, I was, I really, really enjoyed school. I feel sorry for my mum because I think she used to pay for my social life rather than my education because <laughs> I wasn't into my education, but I was very much into the social life at school and the social scene and the good times and the parties and that kind of thing. From school, I went to a Catholic school and I, I did have a Catholic background. So I had a super, holy Catholic grandmother um, and my mother was also really practicing her faith and I can remember looking back and at the time I was really inspired by my mum growing up because she clung to her faith when there was every reason to let go of her faith when there was you know when times were hard and struggle she was struggling she would really cling to her faith. I think have a beautiful relationship with Jesus. So for me, that was something that I, I can remember as a young girl experiencing. So I, I had this at my college years, my high school years, and after leaving school, I kind of lived these two separate lives. Because I had this Catholic upbringing, my friend invited me to a youth group when I was in my high school years. And I went along to this youth group because I just wanted to check it out, basically. And so I had this Catholic upbringing. I went along to youth group, but I think because of the, the pain and the struggles and the hurt that I'd received in, in growing up most of my primary years and my high school years, I probably entered the party scene to escape from the world, entered the party scene of relationships and also drinking um, quite heavily. 
And I probably experienced these two separate lives of going along to youth group, attending church when I, when I wanted to basically, but also having this party life. And I, I lived these two separate lives for quite a number of years. My friend invited me down to a place out of Sydney called Bathurst for a summer school of evangelization. So me and my friend and a group of other young people went down and I must admit, I only went to this summer school because we came from North Queensland, right? And we're going to Sydney and there were trains and shops. So I must admit, I only went to this summer school because I wanted to go to jump on a train to experience being on a train and also shopping. I just wanted to go to all the shops, <laughs> visit all the shops in Sydney. So I arrived down to this summer school and you wouldn't believe it, but this summer school was in country New South Wales and there were no shops. I did get on a train, but there were no shops and I was so angry at God and I didn't really want to be there. And everyone was really happy and joyful. And I just, I, I remember thinking, I can see something in these young people, but it also, I remember thinking a little bit, I want that, but it also, um, I was curious. I wanted to know how were they happy? How were they joyful? How did they get here? <laughs> and why are they here? And I didn't want to be at this event, this summer school. And me and my friend, we didn't attend any of the sessions. We didn't attend any of the classes or any of the rallies or any anything really. We, we went downtown. We actually went to the pub a few times. <laughs> we, we just didn't want to be there. And one of the nights we were hanging outside and we could hear the music. And it was the music that attracted us into the hall that they were having. And it just so happens that they were praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that night. And I laugh now because I think God had his hand on it the whole time. But at the time I was really curious about the music and my friend was a drummer. So he was like, oh, they're, they're, they've got a real band in there. Let's go in and check it out. So we went in and checked it out. And just as we arrived into the hall, these, a team of young people started to do a play about the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And I started to watch them do this dramatic play about Jesus' life and something drew me in. I was captivated by I was captivated by the brutality, but I was really captivated by what Jesus went through. And the man that was playing Jesus, he'd just been crucified and he stood up and there was about 250 young people in the room. And I was sitting right in the middle, up the back being a cool kid up the back. I was sitting up the back and this man who was playing Jesus had just resurrected and he started to walk around and to, to move amongst the crowd, amongst the people. And he started to just, just, just look at everyone. But he came up and he stood right in front of me. And at that second, I don't really know if this was part of the play or not, but at that second, a tear came down his cheek and he stared at me right in the eye. And at that very point, God did something in my heart. It was an experience of, wow, Jesus, you are real. You did die for me and you know my pain. You know the hurts that I've been carrying in my heart. Because I often explain it like my heart was like a closed fist. 
you know, cold and didn't want to, didn't want to open. And it was at that very moment where everything became real. Jesus became real for me. And I can remember that night, I went over to the prayer team. There was a two people praying for this outpouring of the Spirit. And I went because I wanted that something else, you know, that, that more, I wanted more because I just experienced this amazing experience in my heart. And so they prayed with me for the Holy Spirit. They prayed with me for what's called now as baptism in the Holy Spirit, for that releasing and that stirring of the Spirit in my heart. And at that point, and from then on, over time, like it was gradual, over time, I started to let go of the party life. I started to let go that need of wanting to escape or wanting to fix my own heart through drinking or partying. Or I started to let go of that thinking that I can do this life, I can do it on my own, it's all good. Um, and I started to really allow Jesus, I think, to take control of my life and to bring Him into the pain, into the hurt, and to allow Him to become a friend. Because I think, as I said before, I saw Jesus, I saw God as someone far away or someone that didn't really care for me. And I do remember this summer school that I went to where I had my experience of faith. I went along to a seminar that the MGLs were talking at, the Missionaries of God's Love. Father Ken Barker was talking and Judy Bowe from the Sisters was talking. And I went along because I was really interested in who they are, what they do, why they all wear the same clothes. I could not understand that. The MCs announced that there was going to be a seminar. So I thought, I want to check them out. And I went along to this seminar and everything that they talked about, my heart was just pounding. I was so excited about what they were talking about. And I thought to myself, could I be a missionary of God's love sister? Could I do this? And I remember thinking, no, there's no way I could do this. I wasn't holy enough. I wasn't good enough. And I just didn't think that I would be able to be a sister because I've had this, I've been too bad kind of thing. And the main thing was that I just couldn't do it. I'm just not holy enough. And so I kind of, I thought, oh, that's great. That, that, that's bringing in about an excitement in my heart, but I didn't really do anything about it until a little bit later. I think after I had spent time with Jesus and started to fall in love with Him again, and I remembered that feeling that I had about becoming a sister, about joining the missionaries of God's love. And it kind of sparked an, an interest and a curiosity. So I got to a place where I thought, I have to do something about this. I need to look at this. I need to see whether or not I'm meant to be a sister because I just thought I'd get married. Um, and I couldn't decide if I wanted three or four kids. <laughs> I just thought that that's where I was heading. And before my experience of faith and God, I, I was in a pretty serious relationship and I was going down. Most likely, I think, when I joined in my first year, I probably struggled with being away from my family. I have, a, I had, my mum's now in heaven, but I had a really beautiful relationship with her. My mum was my best friend and we were very close. So leaving her was really hard. Um, it was, yeah, probably one of the most difficult things I've done. But God gave me the grace. I can remember saying to my friend, oh, I'll never leave Cairns. Oh, I'll just never leave. 
And he said, well, what if you get married? And what if your husband's working down south? What if you have to leave? And I went, nah, I'll never leave. <laughs> and you know, if I do get married, he's not working down there, he's staying here. <laughs> and God's got other plans. I had lived my whole life with boys because I have three brothers. It's really different living with a bunch of women. <laughs> so that was one of a really big thing I had to adjust because I'd lived with all my brothers and their friends. Like our house was constantly full of my, my brothers and all their mates. So even after I left home, I lived with my brother and a couple of his friends. And so coming into a house full of women was really interesting for me. And I, as a young girl, I used to pray, Lord, I just want a sister. Give me a sister. I've got three brothers and they're pains and they're annoying. God, give me a sister. And he did. <laughs> he gave me a whole sisterhood. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. I was very grateful to God when I arrived, but it was pretty overwhelming because they're all women and they're different. <laughs> Obviously, men and women are different. <laughs> That's obvious, right? But anyway, um, and even now, uh, you know, 20 odd years down the track, there's still times where I do think, well, what am I doing? But God gives me the grace. One of my favourite saints is Saint Therese of Lisieux. And I think we would have been friends back in the day. <laughs> I really love her. Her uh, motto in life is, she would al always say, my vocation is love. We can have all the money, we can have all the fame, we can have all the material possessions, the beautiful house, beautiful car. Um, but if we don't love, everything goes pear-shaped, it goes bad. Or if we don't receive love, our hearts are still gonna search for something. It's a little bit to love and to also have fun, have fun with life, to enjoy life, to enjoy the blessings that God gives, you know, to look over our day and go, what, what, what were the blessings I received today? Where was God in my life today? And to thank Him, to thank Him for each of those blessings. One of my roles also is that I get to take young people on mission. We run a, an evangelization training school at the beginning of the year. And then these young people get to choose what mission trip, I guess, mission immersion, mission trip that they would like to go on. And I have the privilege because I get to take them on mission. So I say my favorite things are being a banana in pajama, being a sister and taking young people on mission. So I get to uh, take young people on mission and get to put in, they put into practice what they'd just been taught about youth ministry and evangelization. And that's what we're on about as missionaries of God's love. Really unforgettable experience that I can remember was a couple of years ago, a group of our sisters went, we, we went, we had a, a sisterhood week where we spend time together. And we called our sisterhood week from the farm to the city. <laughs> and we went out to the farm to one of our sisters who lives out in the bush. And I think this is one of my favorite experiences was one of our sisters is really into horses and she's really good at riding horses, right? So she got on her horse and she had one of the other sisters on the back of the horse. And I really like motorbikes. So she said, oh, you can get on the motorbike. You can put Rachel on the back with you and I'll get on the back with the other sister of the horse. So we're going through the paddocks, they're on the horse, we're on the motorbike and all of a sudden it starts raining and it was stormy. So 
me and the sister, me and Rachel on the motorbike are sliding around because it was really wet. And we're going through this storm. Rosie and the sisters on the horse and me and Rachel on the motorbike. And all of a sudden I hear Rachel say in my ear, she's praying and she said, Lord Jesus, please don't let us die and keep us safe. <laughs> and I just remember laughing my head off <laughs> because here we are. We could have died like it was electrical storm. It was pretty dangerous, but she got us going. She was praying away. <laughs> I have many experiences of sisterhood. We, we put a lot of time and effort into sisterhood. We do lots of fun things as sisters. We'll go out bushwalking. We'll, uh, we went to the snow and, you know, go snowboarding, um, making snowmen and having snow fights. Um, we, we play board games, we make cards together, uh, we do a lot of fun stuff together and building that relationship. So at the end of our day, we have night prayer. So we'll chant the, the we have um, morning, evening and night prayer. And we, it's, it's chanting the Psalms. So at the end of our day, we say, may the Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. So we finish our day with Jesus. And at the very start of the next day, we say, O oh Lord, open our lips. So that's finishing with Him and starting with Him. Some of my favourite activities that I love to do, I like to hang out with my friends. <laughs> do fun things with them. I'm a little bit of an outdoorsy person. I like to spend time outdoors. I love camping and fishing. I love, I have a little scooter <laughs> that I go scooting. I really enjoy that. I cruise around the lake, which is really fun. As sisters, we do everything together. We pray together, we do ministry and mission together, and obviously we live together. And I do find uh, living with my sisters one of my greatest joys. Often you can hear lots of laughter in nearly every room. We do crazy things together. We have a lot of fun together. We watch movies together. Um, you know, as I said, we do board games and do a lot of hanging out together. And I think for me, it's it's a very rich experience. Like, it, and it's probably unique amongst consecrated life today, where you know women are living together and living the life of consecration together. And. Everyone is different <laughs> in the sisterhood. Um, you know, some are crazy fun, some are quieter, some are extroverts, some are introvert. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the biggest blessing. Lots of joy in our house, definitely. <laughs> I took my perpetual vows in 2008. And I often say, I don't know what it's like to get married because I haven't been married, but that was like my wedding day. I can remember walking down the aisle to meet my groom uh, and I had that experience very much of being in this with Jesus and that I was walking down that aisle to meet Him and make my vows to Him for the rest of my life. When I made my final vows, my perpetual vows, the scripture that really um, I took into my vows was Psalm 73, 25. In heaven, I have only you. On this earth, you are all I want. And that's been also a bit of my motto in life. That's carried me through um, my consecration and carried me through this this life 
And it's true, isn't it? In heaven, we only have Jesus. When we get there, we've only got him. But on this earth, he's all I want. And I just want to encourage anyone, any young person who might be searching for their vocation, who might be discerning uh, religious life or becoming a sister or even becoming a priest, whatever it might be, I think just to be open, to be open to what God wants, to, to talk, you know, to have conversation with other sisters, to have conversation with priests, to, to pray, you know, to sit down and ask Jesus, Jesus, what do you want for my life? What do you, is this where you're wanting me? Is this where you're calling me? Uh, and he'll, he'll, he'll tell us, he'll show us. But I think my biggest, I guess my biggest advice for any young person searching for their vocation is to be open and God will show you. He will show you where he wants you. My life is a miracle. Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story.